Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Jen Beagle, Director General of the International Development Law Organization. A warm welcome to you all. It is a pleasure to open this event on women delivering justice, achieving parity in the justice sector. I would like to thank our partners, the permanent missions of Italy and New Zealand to the United Nations, the International Association of Women Judges, the American Bar Association, and the Institute for African Women in Law for supporting this event. I'm speaking to you from Rome, the headquarters of IDLO. It is a pity that we cannot be together in person, but I am pleased that so many have joined us from around the world. I'm also delighted to welcome our great panel of eminent jurists and scholars joining us today from Tunisia, Mauritius, Kenya, the United States, and my own country, New Zealand. We could not have a better group to discuss an incredibly important and timely issue. The ability of women to participate fully and equally in all aspects of public and private life is both an inalienable human right and a fundamental requirement of inclusive and participatory governance. As the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women has noted, any society where women are excluded from public life and decision making cannot call itself truly democratic. This is particularly important for the justice sector, which develops, enforces, and adjudicates laws and policies that govern broad aspects of political, economic, and social life. Ensuring that women have an active role in shaping justice systems, not just as justice seekers, but also as policymakers, adjudicators, and implementers of justice policies, is key to strengthening people's confidence in the justice system's ability to work equally and impartially. Women's participation brings a diversity of experience that helps ground the administration of justice in lived reality and makes laws and institutions more responsive to the specific justice challenges faced by women and girls. Around the world, women judges have made groundbreaking decisions that have transformed the way in which criminal justice has been viewed for decades, even centuries, especially in cases involving rape, sexual violence, and forced marriage, among others. Women lawyers have been in the forefront of campaigns to protect the rights of women, children, the poor, refugees, and other vulnerable groups. In traditional settings, or in cases of assault or intimate partner violence, Women seeking justice are often more comfortable dealing with other women as police officers, judges, lawyers, and court officials. Women judges have led the way to ensure that the court environment is more accommodating for the full range of litigants, including, for example, extending special protection measures for trauma victims or providing facilities that increase accessibility for nursing mothers. That is why it is not only unfortunate but also unfair and an impediment to development that women's participation in the justice sector, including in the judiciary, remains low. While in recent decades, the number of women in the sector has increased, there continues to be a global gender imbalance at all levels. The International Court of Justice, established in 1945, did not have one female member until Dame Rosalind Higgins was elected in 1995. And out of 108 judges, only four have been women. In Europe, OECD suggests that women are close to reaching parity in lower courts, but that women make up only 28% of appeal court judges and 18% in high courts. The United Nations study on women judiciary in the Arab states showed that only 80 out of 12,000 judges were women, a representation rate of less than 1%. These figures demonstrate an egregious lack of parity, despite decades of commitments and declarations on gender equality. Around the world, a panoply of formal and informal barriers combine to keep women out of the justice sector and limit their ability to be promoted. These range from stereotypes and prejudiced attitudes to a lack of transparency in recruitment and promotion processes or legal and social restrictions on women's mobility and access to finance, which can act as major obstacles. Given the compelling case for gender equality in the justice sector, 
dismantling these barriers must be our collective priority. And the COVID crisis has made this clearer than ever. IDLO mainstreams gender equality throughout our work, but we also have focused interventions on addressing the specific justice challenges faced by women and girls. Enhancing women's representation and leadership in the justice sector is one such priority. This includes reviewing relevant laws and policies governing the justice sector. For instance, in Kenya, we partnered with the National Gender and Equality Commission and the International Association of Women Judges to conduct a gender audit of the judiciary. It analyzed the judiciary's legal, policy, and institutional framework and made several recommendations to promote gender inclusion, equity, and equality. This tool can be made available in other countries. Adilo also works in countries experiencing or emerging from conflict to ensure that women justice professionals have the necessary protection and resources to participate in the justice sector. As part of an initiative to understand and help mitigate the impact of insecurity in the justice sector in Afghanistan, we are working to ensure that justice professionals, particularly women, can work more safely in rural or remote areas. We know that the presence of women role models and mentors on the bench has a positive effect in inspiring female students to follow in their footsteps. So it is important to support women judges and law networks at the national, regional, and international levels. In Uganda, for example, IDLO is supporting the National Association of Women Judges in advocating for gender responsive justice in the courts. A crucial and often overlooked component are customary and informal justice systems, where the majority of the world's disputes, particularly those involving family and personal law, are resolved. Ensuring women's participation in such systems, which are traditionally male dominated, is an important way to increase access to justice and respect for the rights of women and girls. In Somalia, where IDLO is promoting access to justice through alternative dispute resolution centers that use the customary here system to resolve disputes, we work to include women as adjudicators, counselors, and advisors. These women are critical to cases involving domestic violence and other forms of gender-based violence and support women to raise their concerns to the ADR panels, which are still predominantly male. Much more, of course, needs to be done. A key impediment to change is the lack of publicly available and consistently monitored national data on women's participation. Even with a dedicated SDG target on the proportion of positions in public institutions, data on women justice professionals continues to be incomplete and inconsistent. There is an urgent need to develop an international comparable data methodology to measure all aspects of women's participation in the justice sector. At IDLO, we have been working to address this deficit by publishing reports capturing regional data on women justice professionals. IDLO has conducted research in Afghanistan, Tunisia, and Kenya. The work with national partners has combined quantitative and qualitative data to highlight gender disparities and recommended concrete actions to increase the number of women justice professionals. In conclusion, our experience shows that while there is a long way to go before we reach parity, it is an achievable goal if we all work together. As the late Justice Ginsburg said, women belong in all places where decisions are being made. It shouldn't be that women are the exception. I look forward to hearing your insights on bridging the gender gap in the justice sector. I'm pleased to hand over to our moderator, Ilaria. Many thanks, Director General John Beagle, for your powerful words of introduction and uh, welcome again uh, to today's panel discussion. I'm Ilaria Bottigliero. I will be your moderator today. I'm the Director of Research and Learning at IDLO, and uh, it is my distinct pleasure and a real honor to be moderating this wonderful event today. Before introducing our panel of eminent speakers, um, I would like to just share with you a few housekeeping rules that are uh, quite common to the Zoom webinar setting. 
with which I'm sure you're already uh, quite familiar. However, let me just remind you that um, the uh, discussions today will be recorded. Um, we are in fact live both on Facebook and on UN Web TV. And uh, the recording of the webinar uh, will be available on IDLO's webinar right after the end of the webinar. We also have a chat uh, where um, you can interact with other uh, participants and uh, you can exchange or post links. And uh, we hope that the chat will be quite lively throughout the discussion. If you wish to pose uh, a question, uh, we will have two uh, dedicated segments during the panel discussion at the end of each set of speakers. Um, you will be able to pose your question through the Q&A button, which is at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A will be moderated by our gender team. So we will uh, try to ensure that as many questions are picked up by our panelists. We are also um, uh, featuring today a system of simultaneous interpretation that we are providing in English, French, and Spanish. So you uh, should feel free to click the interpretation button located in your webinar controls. And that's all for the housekeeping rules. So I'm going to move um, immediately to introducing with great pleasure our uh, speakers today. I will start with the first panel of speakers. So let me please um, welcome, it is a great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency Iman al zahweni Huimel, who is the Minister of Women, Children and the Elderly of Tunisia. Welcome, Her Excellency. We also have with us the Honorable Justice Susan Glazebrook, Judge of the Supreme Court of New Zealand and President-elect of the International Association of Women Judges. A very well welcome, Justice. And we also have with us the Honorable Justice Aruna Devi Narain, who is Judge of the Supreme Court of the Republic of Mauritius and Vice Chairperson and Rapporteur of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. A very warm welcome. So today our panelists will shed some light on the important question of women delivering justice and how can we really achieve uh, parity in the justice sector. We are going to explore three broad areas. Now we're going to look at the challenges to gender equality in the justice sector, especially within the current COVID-19 context. We are then going to look at uh, some broad directions for policy and programming to prioritize gender balance in the justice sector. So what can we do to prioritize and to do better in terms of ensuring gender parity in the justice sector? And we will also talk about data and recommendations for better research and analysis, especially to support the SDGs and Agenda 2030. So without uh, further ado, uh, let me please move into the heart of our panel discussion by handing the floor to Her Excellency Iman Halzahweni Huimel. It's a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Mrs. Director General of IDLU, the Vice President and Rapporteur of the CEDAW Committee, the President of the International Association of Women Judges, the President of the American Bar Association, dear participants, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of the side event held on the sidelines of the 65th session of the CSW and following the celebration of the International Women's Rights Day. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the participation of the women in decision-making positions, especially in the justice sector, remains a crucial topic to be debated as we cannot conceive equality on access to justice and rights without the effective and equal participation of women. In Tunisia, women's access to justice was initiated by, by an egalitarian national and international legal framework and a progressive political context, which allow the appointment of a first female judge in 1968 and in the Supreme Council of Justice, SCG, in 1986. In addition, according to the law establishing the Constitutional Court of uh, 2015, an obligation to respect parity during election and the appointment of members of the court is required. As for the establishment of the SCG, Tunisian legislation has opted for good practices in terms of the presence of women in the council through the requirement of parity in the election of candidates of the same rank in the ballot. The legislation is a first, the is a first in the world, and we hope inspire, it inspires other legislation in other countries. This, this measure enabled the presence of more than 56% the elected candidates. In addition, the percentage of women magistrates in the judicial order is almost 42% at the level of judicial justice, 52% at the level of financial justice, and 54% at the level of administrative justice. In this context, it's important to acknowledge the important role played by specialized civil society in the field, which pleads for such parity. However, in practice, certain gender-based discrimination persists in uh, access of women judges to specific functions, such as high judicial of criminal functions, public prosecutor, substitute judges, investigating judges, etc., real estate, and even taxation. These discriminations have their origin in different personal reasons, difficult reconciliations between the full-time availability required in these functions and the day-to-day -day management of family and children affairs, or professional related to the security of women judge, domain of terrorism, real estate, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, Tunisia, aware of these challenges faced by women judges, has created the Council of Peers to Equality and Equal Opportunities between Women and Men to ensure gender mainstreaming in planning, programming, evaluation, and budgeting to eliminate all forms of discrimination between women and men. The Council prepared a national action plan for gender integration where that was adopted in June 2018. The plan aims to support women's participation in decision-making uh, positions, including in the justice sectors. To incentivize this SCG to appoint women to judicial decision-making position, our ministry proposed to strengthen the composition of the board by a SCG representative. Furthermore, in the context of the implementation of Resolution 1325, and in view of the very important role to be played by the judiciary in the prevention and protection of women and specifically of the GBV survivors, trafficking and terrorism. Tunisia has adopted a national action plan of focus on women's participation in judicial and security decision-making position. A sector plan is being developed at the Ministry of Justice level to implement, implement this priority. It should be not that for the first time in Tunisia, a female judge was appointed to head 
the Minister of Justice in 2020, and also another woman just, judge is appointed as acting Minister of Justice in 2021. I am perfectly convinced that the consecration of an effective participation of, of women will necessarily impact the quality of justice, especially if it is, a, if it is associated with in-depth training of men and women judges on the good management of cases with the justice system, and if it is accompanied by good measures of accompanying women before the courts. We would like to highlight that the presence of women in justice is not reduced to a number, but exceeds it for a culture of human rights during their judicial functions. In this perspective, female judges can meet the challenges of impunity against all forms uh, of violence against women and ensure that litigants receive a fair trial. Moreover, our ministry is working with the various stakeholders in the justice sector to integrate the gender approach into judicial policy, policy in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I would like to reaffirm my personal convention and that the, of the Tunisian government for equality of women in, uh, and men in justice as, it's, as it remains a fundamental choice to change the perception of authority, authority. Indeed, such equality helps to modify roles in society, society to combat stereotypes and to eliminate discriminations. The side event is certainly an opportunity to exchange good practices and to appreciate the advances in the various fields. However, we still have some way to go to strengthen the presence of women in the bodies, ensuring the independence of the judiciary, such as the SCG, the institutions governing the training of judges, lawyers, and court officers, but also to rationalize the criteria of access to the various decision-making making positions. My sincere encouragement for our work, which I hope will be successful. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks. Thank you, Madame la Ministre, uh, Her Excellency. It was a pleasure to hear from you and to hear about your personal commitment as well as that of the government to gender parity and to gender equality in the justice sector. It's very encouraging for us and, uh, uh, and important to hear that Tunisia is on, is on a great path, really, and an example for other countries to uh, ensure that gender equality is uh, present uh, in the justice sector. Thank you. I would now like to give the floor to uh, the Honorable Justice Susan Blaisbrook. And we're all very much looking forward to hearing your perspective, Justice. The floor is yours. E na Maria Kuro Oteao, e akufe faia, tena koto, tena koto, moria mai te arua ma me te mame, kiotato mate. Mo te tokorua o ki hihinga ki Afghanistan, haere na mate, haere atura, tato te hunga ora, tēnā tato katoa. I have greeted you all in te reo Māori, the language of the Indigenous people of Aotearoa New Zealand, and one of the official languages of my country. As is customary, I have acknowledged those who have gone before us. In particular, I acknowledge Judge Katria Yassini and Judge Zakia Harawi, two of my sister judges from Afghanistan who were gunned down and killed on their way to perform their judicial functions. Their deaths are, of course, a major tragedy for their families, their loved ones, and their colleagues, both in Afghanistan and globally. We mourn them. But of course, violence against public figures has wider implications, and those are very relevant to our topic today. The killings were part of a wider campaign of violence targeting public figures 
who support a move towards a more inclusive and fair society in Afghanistan. Women public figures have been especially targeted in an obvious attempt to intimidate not only women holding public office, but women generally. It is an attack on the very heart of society, the rule of law and equality. I pay tribute to and salute the courage of all those judges and public figures everywhere in the world who continue to perform their public service duties in the face of violence and danger and in these times of COVID-19, the real risk of death by disease. This is not the time to discuss in detail security or other measures that may avert such tragedies in the future. I do, however, venture to suggest that ensuring the equal representation of and true equality of women in the justice sector is one of the most important measures. Protective not just of the safety of women judges through safety in numbers, but also protective of justice and equality more generally. Gender parity in the justice sector makes a number of important contributions to society, including importantly, better outcomes. And it would be remiss not to mention the enriching contribution to judicial institutions and to society in general that is brought by other traditionally disadvantaged groups when they achieve judicial office. In the short time available, I can't cover all aspects of what's needed to achieve a truly diverse judiciary. So I thought I would concentrate on what I consider to be the false dichotomy between merit and diversity. On the one hand, there is the proposition that those selected to be judges should be the most highly qualified and capable persons in society. This is because the decisions that judges make have such significant consequences. It's therefore been argued that merit should be the only touchstone when considering judicial appointments. This, the proponents say, may in time lead to gender equality as meritorious women candidates emerge but diversity should not be allowed to diminish quality. On the other hand, those advocating for diversity say that this is far too narrow a view. Merit is vital, but the judiciary also needs to be representative and hence diverse in order to serve the population properly. These um, proponents therefore argue that diversity should be seen as an element of merit. And on this view, diversity is intrinsic to and not secondary to merit. It'll be obvious that I subscribe to the latter view, but I go further and say that we need to challenge the very idea of merit as it is traditionally applied to judicial appointments. Merit is commonly perceived as an objective standard, but the reality is it is no such thing. The criteria to assess merit may appear neutral, but these criteria are based on those already thought to be successful in fulfilling the functions of the post and who are predominantly male. This results in the selection process unfairly advantaging candidates who are most similar to past appointees and to the selectors themselves. As such, rather than being a fair and transparent process that achieves gender diversity and other diversity, the merit-based system becomes a process that excludes women and other groups on the basis that they lack merit, but merit as defined by the current holders of power. And that leads, as Baroness Brenda Hale has said, to a judiciary that is not only predominantly male, but also pale and stale. These issues are exacerbated um, by discrimination, bias, stereotyping, and structural inequalities in society as a whole, including in the judiciary itself. And uh, time um, does not permit um, to expand on those matters, but um, we all understand them. We will need creative thinking, adaptability, and perseverance to achieve our end of a truly diverse uh, judiciary, but only then will we have true justice. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Justice. And uh, thank you especially for your uh, very important tribute 
to the women judges killed uh, in Afghanistan and for reminding us also of the difficult circumstances in which women in the justice sector uh, operate. Uh, so it's very important to reflect on that. And, um, and also uh, thank you for your reflections on the merit-based uh, structure, um, which of course um, is, is many times problematic for women. So I very much look forward to expanding on this point also during our uh, broader discussion. I see already several uh, questions uh, coming up on, uh, on this precise issue. So to be, to be continued for sure. So it is now my uh, pleasure to uh, give the floor to the Honorable Justice Aruna Devi Narain, uh, who in her capacity as Vice Chairperson and Rapporteur of the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, Justice, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Botilira. Excellencies, my sister judge, Susan Glazebrook, fellow panelists, dear colleagues and participants. I'd like to start by thanking IDLO for inviting me to this very interesting panel discussion, which does build on its work on gender parity in the judiciary in Tunisia, Kenya, Afghanistan, and many other states. I commend its consistent and solid work of, uh, in this area since its pledge to the UN General Assembly in 2012. And I also wish to congratulate Son Excellence Madame la Ministre for Tunisia's achievements with regard to gender parity in its judiciary. Now, I'm not supposed to present Mauritius as a case study today, but in the light of some exchanges in the chat box, I cannot resist flagging that we have, as at present, 16 women judges out of a total of 24 at the Supreme Court, that is 66.67% 6 or two thirds. Not too bad a figure, especially when you consider that three of the five senior most judges are women. Women are very well represented in subordinate courts as well. And I'm very pleased to note the constant emergence of very promising and dynamic women at the junior bar. Sadly, however, there are only two women senior counsel and this very low number of, of, uh, uh, of, of women hardly does justice to the talent, skills and professionalism of women barristers and Mauritius which in my opinion deserve greater recognition at that level. Before I proceed further, I should state for the record that whatever I say today binds neither the Supreme Court of Mauritius nor the CEDAW Committee. So following up on Susan's very interesting expose, I would wish within the very short time that I have to focus on gender parity in the judiciary from the point of view of CEDAW, and if I have time, I would like to briefly highlight some work done in this area by ERO Asia Pacific, with which I had the honor and pleasure of being associated. So first, in relation to CEDAW, a reference has already been made in the concept note to Article 7 of the Convention, under which the CEDAW Committee presses in its constructive dialogues with state parties for the elimination of discrimination against women in public and political life. That allows us as members of the committee to ask for statistics on the number of women occupying judicial and quasi-judicial posts in the state party, on the appointment and promotion process, on any obstacles in the career paths and so on, and to make recommendations accordingly in our concluding observations, better known as COPs. Over and above the issue of gender representation in public life under Article 7, which is certainly very important, I myself like to link the issue of gender parity in the judiciary with the fundamental issue of women's access to justice, bringing in Articles 2, 5a and 15 of the, of the Convention as well. I find support for that from CEDAW General Recommendation 33, on women's access to justice. For those of you not familiar with our general recommendations or GRs, they are the counterpart of general comments issued by the Human Rights Committee under the ICCPR. They are in a way our doctrine, just like our views on communications under the optional protocol or our case law. And I noted for the first time today that footnote 23 to the general recommendation 
mentions an IDLU report of 2013 on accessing justice, which is quite appropriate. You can, of course, find all our 38 general recommendations on our website, on the CEDAW website. Coming back to General Recommendation 33, it sets out the six very important components of women's access to justice, justiciability, availability, accessibility, good quality, provision of remedies, and accountability of justice systems. And under justiciability, the very first component, we make a recommendation at paragraph 15F that state parties confront and remove barriers to women's participation as professionals within all bodies and levels of judicial and quasi-judicial systems and providers in justice-related services. That this takes steps, including temporary special measures to ensure that women are equally represented in the judiciary, but also in other law implementation mechanisms as prosecutors, public defenders, lawyers, administrators, mediators, law enforcement officials, judicial and penal officials, and expert practitioners, as well as in other professional capacities. We should not be limited to only judges for the justice system to be uh, an equal and balanced one. I need hardly add that the justiciability component would require more than a set number of women as judges. The whole judicial system has to be made more gender responsive and male and female judges alike have to be sensitized so as to handle cases in a gender sensitive manner, while of course, remaining legally sound, balanced and impartial. Under accountability, which is another component of women's access to justice, at paragraph 20 of the general recommendation, we monitor compliance with this component by requiring the state party to collect data on the number of women and men in judicial and quasi-judicial institutions at all levels. And as you will be aware, indicator 16.7.1 of the Sustainable Development Goals also requires proportions of positions in the judiciary by sex and of course other criteria. We further make it clear in the GR that the requirement of equal participation of women at all levels should also apply to specialized judicial and quasi-judicial systems and to international and regional justice systems. I was very happy to hear earlier reference being made to Professor Rosalind Higgins, who was my suit in public international law and of course was a very distinguished ICJ judge. Um, within the short time that I have, I know I'm probably running out of time, but I would like to very quickly flag uh, uh, work of the Euro Asia Pacific in this area, particularly the, the part with which I have been associated. And these are the thematic judicial colloquia as part of its Judges for, Gen for Gender Justice Initiative, one of which led to the Bellagio Decla Declaration on the role of the judiciary in ensuring access to justice for gender-based violence in an effective, competent manner and with a gender perspective. But the one I uh, uh, helped in uh, drafting, I contributed to the drafting of, was in uh, 2019, the Colombo Declaration on the role of the judiciary in advancing women's right to equality in marriage and family relations. And here again, uh, the uh, judges uh, present at the, at the colloquium uh, considered that women should be equally represented as members of all courts, tribunals, or other bodies, including those authorized to pronounce on the rights and obligations of women in marriage and family relations. And we recommended that the authorities responsible for judicial appointments and promotions take effective steps towards the achievement of gender balance in all such courts, tribunals, or other bodies. So to conclude, gender parity in all courts and judicial bodies, and particular emphasis in these two declarations on gender-based violence and marriage and family relations. Um, and uh, I would have said more about that, but the customary systems have already been highlighted by the director in her introduction. I think I will leave it here and I'd be happy to answer any question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice. And uh, for us as a rule of law organization, of course, the, the work of the CEDA committee is absolutely fundamental uh, to uphold the, the rule of law, 
And, uh, and of course, the CEDAW Convention is an absolute must. And uh, we are very grateful for uh, your work and for your persistence in uh, uh, issuing the gen general recommendations that guide our collective uh, views and interventions on uh, participation of women in the justice sector and beyond, of course, access to justice and, uh, and many, many other uh, important topics, as, as we know. So we have now um, uh, concluding the first set of, uh, of speakers. And I see from the chat that many questions are um, uh, coming up for our speakers. There is a lot of uh, um, enthusiasm and uh, a lot of uh, interest uh, generated for the issues that have been discussed. I have a question. Uh, as I suspected on the issue of merit. Uh, so for the Honorable uh, Justice Glazebrook, um, your point on, on merit, uh, we have um, uh, a friend, um, um, Nomalubi Kiwinana, who is asking, uh, she's agreeing with your uh, submission, uh, particularly when you realize that those that are said to be appropriate to be appointed lack the quality. So she's asking, how do we change the narrative? How, what can we do to change the narrative about uh, merit and to ensure that uh, the selection of women justice professionals is made uh, on a, a fairer basis? Thank you. Thank you. It's a, a very good question, and I wish I uh, was able um, to to answer it in a in a simplistic manner. It's obviously not uh, an easy question to to answer because it does mean that one has to fundamentally rethink what one wants from justice, what one wants from judges, and then to look at appointing people that uh, will in fact fulfil those qualities. It's not quite as simple either as just looking at uh, the immediate appointment of judges, especially in common law systems that happens after some time in practice. And so we do need equality at all levels of the judicial uh, of the judicial pipeline. Um, I hate those terms, but in any event, um, people are normally appointed from the senior uh, parts of the profession and common law systems. And uh, we need to change that perception right through. In civil law systems, often um, it, there are there is equality at the um, lower levels, but promotion is difficult. And again, it's changing that perception of merit. And I would venture to say, really changing how we deliver justice and what we think about it to make it truly inclusive for for everyone. But not an easy question and not an easy answer. No, definitely. And uh, thank you, Justice. Um, I would move to perhaps a question um, who could be addressed to uh, Justice uh, Narain. Um, we have uh, a friend, uh, Samira Ardalani, uh, who is asking um, uh, your views um, on the fact that in courts, a woman's testimony has half the evidentiary value of a man's testimony. So is there some legal regime, international treaty mechanism, or what is the position of the CEDAW uh, committee to hold such regimes accountable for not respecting equality and equal opportunities? I'm going to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for this question. Um, I'm not very clear as to the country from which the um, the colleague is from. Uh, which country is she from? I believe the colleague is from Iran, uh, but I am not 100% sure. Which, which is not a state party to the convention, <laughs> unfortunately, as far as I can remember. But uh, had the, the, the country been a state party to the convention, and in particular, if the, the, the country had been a, a party to the optional protocol to the convention, OPSIDOR, 
then any individual from that uh, country, from the state party, could have uh, made a communication, what we call a communication under the optional protocol. And then the committee, as a quasi-judicial uh, international um, committee, considers the communication and considers whether that particular practice that's been highlighted is in breach of the convention and can uh, can can uh, adjudicate can uh, determine that it amounts to a breach of the convention and recommend a particular course of action and it sometimes is a general of a general nature and sometimes even of a, a particular nature that is in some cases we have even um, awarded damages to the complainant uh, so that would be uh, under the optional protocol to CEDO. But even if the country is not a party to the uh, optional protocol to CEDO, but only a state party to the convention, then as you know, state parties come before us uh, and have constructive dialogues with the committee. And as part of the constructive dialogue, we can put a question to the state party and, and, and say, uh, well, in your country, uh, uh, the evidence of women is not worth as much as the evidence of men. And we do not find any justification for that. And in, what, what do you propose to do about it? And then, uh, then we will comment in our concluding observations on the response of the state party. And we will make recommendation again. And as you know, when the country comes next to be uh, reviewed, we will ask the country again, what have you done on our recommendation? So this is the mechanism by which we would hold uh, state parties to account. Unfortunately, it, it does look like this particular country is not the state party to CEDO, so there's not much that the CEDO committee uh, can do in, as part, part of its um, uh, the mechanism at its uh, disposal, but of course it, it can comment, like I can comment at, a, at an uh, event like this one, that this is uh, something that uh, we do not feel uh, affords uh, women the equal protection of the law and does not treat women at par with men in, in uh, the justice system. So uh, we definitely do not feel that uh, this is in accord with the convention. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Justice. And thank you for guiding through guiding us through the procedure, uh, which is very important because many times um, uh, women's equal representation in the justice sector is a matter of process uh, of, of procedure. So the, the um, exhaustion of remedies at the local level and of course at the international level becomes a fundamental step and sometimes it can make a difference. So your uh, contribution is, is very, very much appreciated irrespective of the country. Of course, we are talking generally about uh, contributions. Um, we have a question from Judge uh, Micheline Brady uh, of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon in The Hague. Perhaps, Justice uh, Glazebrook, you could help us um, clarify this issue. Uh, Justice Brady asks, do you think that in some countries, women judges are still vastly underrepresented in top ranking positions? And what could be the remedies? Uh, yes, certainly um, women are underrepresented in um, top ranking positions in the judiciary worldwide. Uh, I suppose the other side of that is sometimes when women are not underrepresented in the judiciary, we land up with a judiciary that is not as respected because it is seen um, as a female dominated profession as being somehow inferior to other professions that are male dominated. And that is um, in itself a problem as well for obvious reasons, uh, because if a judiciary is not respected and not seen as a good profession, then justice and the rule of law are not seen as uh, as, as important as in um, countries where, uh, where that is not the case. So we have both sides of that problem. Uh, one, um, Again, the solutions are not easy. And I think, as I said, I think it does mean a fundamental rethink of what we mean by justice, a fundamental rethink of what we mean by the courts, a fundamental rethink of what merit is in this context. None of these things are going to be easy. They're going to take time, but they are endeavours that we, we just have to um, undertake. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Justice. Uh, very, very, uh, I very much agreeing with uh, with your position. 
we have many, many more questions, but I'm afraid we have to move on also with our program. And um, um, I can assure the, uh, the audience that we will have um, a second set, um, a second time, open time for discussions uh, after uh, the second panel. Uh, so please continue uh, sharing your questions and we will try to uh, pick up as many as possible. Uh, in the meantime, please uh, let me welcome our second panel of speakers and, uh, of course, thanking our, uh, our guests so far. Um, so the second panel of uh, eminent speakers is composed by uh, Ms. Patricia Lirico, who is the president of the uh, ABA, the American Bar Association. It's a pleasure having you with us today. We also have with us Dr. Ruth Ora Odiambo, the Dean of the Faculty of Law of Egerton University in Kenya. Welcome, uh, Dr. Odiambo. And we also have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Jarpa Dawuni, who is Associate Professor of Political Science at Howard University. So it's, uh, it's wonderful to have you here this afternoon. Many thanks for joining us on this panel. And without further ado, I would give the floor uh, to Ms. Patricia Lirico, uh, the president of the ABA. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And it's really an honor to be here with such distinguished panelists. Let me thank IDLO for convening this important discussion and the American Bar Association is of course very proud to be a co-sponsor. As we promote the rule of law, the ABA has been dedicated to eliminating bias and securing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the legal profession and the justice system, including the full and equal participation of women. Inclusion means ensuring that women not only have full access to justice and equality under the law, but also that they are leaders within the legal community and the justice sector. We continue to miss the extraordinary leadership of US Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whom UN Women honored on International Human Rights Day in December. Justice Ginsburg's path-breaking transformations of the legal landscape and her global legacy of championing women's rights and gender equality will always be with us. As gender, Justice Ginsburg often highlighted, women are underrepresented throughout the legal landscape, from courtrooms to law firms, to mediators and arbitrators, to senior positions in law schools. The disproportionate absence of women, especially at the top of these institutions, has far reaching implications because justice systems are where important decisions are made that affect nearly every aspect of life. For decades, the American Bar Association has produced a multitude of research on women in the legal profession, examining barriers, gathering gender specific data and offering solutions. The first report from the ABA Commission on Women in the Profession in 1988 was issued under the leadership of the commission's first chair, then a practicing lawyer from the state of Arkansas named Hillary Rodham Clinton. It was a truly groundbreaking study, reporting that discriminatory barriers were part of the professional culture. It also noted that the anticipated significant increases in the number of women lawyers alone would not eliminate those barriers. What was needed, the report urged, was a thorough re-examination of the attitudes and structures of the US legal profession. We've made progress over the years to be sure. Back then, only 20% of lawyers were women. 10% of federal judges in the US were women. Today, women are roughly 40% of lawyers, 33% of judges, and about 50% of law students. And with Kamala Harris, for the first time ever, a woman, a lawyer of color is serving as the vice president of the United States. Still, women lawyers as a whole continue to face barriers, which are even higher for women lawyers of color. The ABA's report issued last year left out and left behind 
explores the unique experiences and obstacles for women lawyers of color. Women lawyers are still far underrepresented in senior positions and remain only 25% of law firm partners in the US. Women lawyers of color are only 4% of partners. Women lawyers continue to face persistent gender pay gaps in US law firms where women partners earn 20 to 27% less than our male peers. The ABA works to identify and remove discriminatory laws and practices promote professional development and enact institutional reforms, such as better workplace practices, more effective sponsorship and mentoring, more equitable promotion and compensation decisions, and greater access to business development opportunities for women lawyers. Our research toolkits and programs rely on quantitative and qualitative analysis to monitor and track measurable changes with ongoing assessments and enhancements. The ABA's leadership on gender equality supports the work we do globally to advance the rule of law. Since 1991, the ABA Rule of Law Initiative and its precursors have worked in more than 100 countries to strengthen legal professions and judiciaries. We use highly collaborative and inclusive approaches to empower women generally and to advance women's inclusion in all aspects of the legal and justice sectors as is essential under the rule of law. As we emerge from the pandemic, we must redouble our efforts to improve the legal and justice sectors, removing bias, prejudice, and discrimination. We must ensure that the legal profession has both the depth and breadth of well-trained and talented diverse lawyers to serve the range of clients who need legal and justice services, especially those requiring access to basic human necessities. In a system based on the rule of law, we must enable all lawyers and justice actors to thrive. And as we do so, let me offer three suggestions for action. First, we must continue to foster collaborative relationships, creating connections at the local, regional and international levels for building sustainable, supportive networks across borders. Second, we must increase resources for research, data collection and analysis on women's participation in the legal profession and justice sectors. And third, we must firmly embed diversity, equity and inclusion activities within justice system capability building initiatives. Together, we can overcome barriers and blaze new trails to ensure women's full participation in the legal profession and justice sectors and in all aspects of life. We must build inclusive justice systems that provide more access to more people in better ways, that service the rights of all with justice and fairness, and that move us closer to sustainable, peaceful societies grounded in the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rifo. It's, uh, it's a real uh, honor and we are very grateful for, for ABA's partnership and for uh, the constant work that you do in terms of gathering data and for your field intervention. Um, at IDLO, we have partnered many times with the ABA and uh, uh, your research has been instrumental really for uh, our work in this sector. I'm also grateful for um, your emphasis on um, intersectionality issues. Uh, the fact that um, uh, it, it, gender parity in the justice sector is difficult for women in general, but then when you add on the element of race, the element of ethnic, uh, ethnic elements, it becomes even more difficult to uh, achieve those uh, higher roles that to which women should aspire and where we should be seeing parity by now. So thank you very much for your contribution on that.
let me now um, hand over the, the floor with great pleasure uh, to Dr. Ruth Ora Odiambo, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Law of uh, Egerton University in Kenya. Uh, the floor is your Dean. Uh, I wish to thank IDLO, the organizers for the, this panel, uh, to enable us to share our thoughts and the experiences and how best we can increase uh, women's participation in the justice sector. It is an important, it is an important discussion for us, particularly during the pandemic situation. Uh, just before I start, uh, I wish to inform the um, participants that IDLO sometimes back in 2018, 2019, conducted a, a research which is evidence-based that highlighted key issues that affect women's participation in the justice sector. And uh, when I talk about participation in the justice sector, it was not only concentrated on the judiciary, but it covered a wide areas, a wide sectors in the justice sector, because you realize there's a chain and it starts from different um, institutions. For me as an academician, our participation begins from the law school at the very, at the middle level, leave alone from the high school. Because if we don't have more women in the law school, it means that the numbers that we're going to churn out, you know, to go to the justice sector is going to be limited. How then do we start increasing the numbers from there? And then that is just a thought for now. And uh, my key thing is to say that we have strong normative structures in Kenya, we have tried to implement the national, the international um, instruments, localize them, and even a policy. But despite all these, they're very strong worded, but the reality is still very far from what the provisions, uh, from what the, the, the instruments provide. The, the women are very few, still at the apex where we need them because that's where key decisions are made that affect their lives and how they can even impact on the outcome of the, 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 the outcome of cases that they address that deal with women's issues. And so it is important to have very many women in the justice sector because it has an impact on the general impact or the general outcome you know, for women accessing justice. First of all, we know that women start from a disadvantaged position. They are poor. And even if they are poor, there's a lot of uh, patriarchal issues surrounding their access to justice. They are not learned and sometimes they don't have the, they don't, they are not, they, they are, they are not well conversant with the law. So their legal literacy is, is very poor. And so if you're entering into a justice system, which is male dominated, you know, with a very um, clear or uncertain or a blind gender perspective to women's problems, then it becomes a great challenge for women accessing justice. And therefore it is very important, not only to have women participating as judges, but also empowering women to understand that they have rights and this right, they have avenues where they can be addressed, okay? And, and that's uh, to just highlight uh, some other things that really happened that we really need to know. A colleague of mine said that uh, marital status sometimes is based on recruitment. I think it, that is something which we should not at this point or in age where we are rich development should be a thing of the past because there is an issue of equality regardless of the status, whether political, sex, pregnancy, and all that, one, that should not apply. So we look at marriage as something, as a, a status, 
that must be important for someone to be recruited is a problem. That's notwithstanding, in Kenya we have uh, very uh, expressive political, I mean, uh, constitutional provisions, very explicit, that outlaws discrimination on all spheres, uh, on all grounds across the board, whether on pregnancy, political affiliation, you know, um, marital status, we're supposed to be treated equally. But we just know that even though the law provides and it gives us a framework so that if there's a violation, we have a fallback position, you know, to address, you know, but they still affect us. So if you make it, if you expressly make it in your law that marital status is a condition to you as a stepping stone to getting to employment in the justice sector, especially for judges, then you are limiting the numbers, which is already problematic to get to that level. And then of course, there's a lot of sexual harassment at the workplace, not even at the workplace, even at, um, at, at, at the university where I teach, you occasionally have problems with female students having uh, problems with the, le the, the male lecturers. You know, they say you have to meet at a particular time beyond class at 7 p.m. And if you don't comply, sometimes it affects your grade. Now, how do you expect such a person to get to the next level when you know that when someone is sexually harassed, you know the psychological effects that come with it, they can also be affected to the level where they can't continue with their studies. So you are actually jeopardizing the life of that person. So when we normalize these things and it is not properly addressed at the academic level, then we are also limiting the numbers. And even as we go to the judiciary, because we, were, we made sexual harassment, we normalize sexual harassment at the university, our female colleagues, then when they sexually harassed at the workplace or in the justice sector, they say it is normal because there's no one properly addressing these issues. And this is a key thing which sometimes we ignore, but it's really important. And then the issue of networks and mentorship, this hasn't been referred and I really don't want to repeat it. If we want the numbers of women to increase and get that parity, we need very strong networks at the local, regional and international level for support and provide mentorship that propels us then to go to the level that is required to accent the apex positions of decision making. And then of course the usual things, the political. Sometimes we lack the political goodwill or it is there, but sometimes the people who are actually implementing do not reflect the political will of the state that wants to promote gender equality. And some key things, which is very common, which also we are not, uh, we need to address. COVID affected girls in different ways. And especially, especially girls, we have a lot of girls who got pregnant in the course during the pandemic. And that means their education is affected. When the education is affected, you don't expect these girls to attain the grades that they need to go to the law school. And then by extension, then you limit their entry point to the, uh, to the law school and then also to the justice sector because the entry points are very competitive. So you have already something pulling them back, it becomes a problem. And because some of these challenges are very common, I think I'll just to maybe highlight some of the solutions because of time, I need to respect the time of those six requirements is that we need to do a lot of uh, awareness creation. I don't need to expand this too much, but you know, an uh, awareness creation in terms of legal literacy and also, and particularly, encouraging women to take advantage of the progressive legal provisions that we have. Because if you do not know, it becomes such a big problem. Sometimes we say, what you don't know will not hurt you. But if we don't know the legal provisions that protect women and that can help them to propel to the next higher level, how then 
can we say that they're not hurt, they'll be hurt. So legal literacy is very key. And then other than creating awareness on the progressive uh, legal provisions, we really need to confront, you know, the stereotypes, the traditional stereotypes that is associated with women. So that even if you are at a high level, you're a judge, but for our brothers, our uh, uh, female, male friends, they still see us women and they try to make us, they start to believe in us or they, uh, we have to apply ourselves or we have to be very aggressive, overly aggressive to prove a point and that needs to change. And that can only change when we have a narrative that is amplified from, na from national to regional to international level to send a message. And then of course, the issue of, progress, uh, of promotion is a problem in the justice sector. Whether uh, a colleague of mine said in the law firms, that is very problematic because I also have a chance to practice. We find that female lawyers are employed at very low, lower level compared to the, 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 the male colleagues and their salary will be lower. Tough cases that would make them to be famous or to be known are never given to the females. They're given only to the male colleagues. How then do we publicize you know, the good skills that our female colleagues have? So we need to encourage this proper career progression, proper promotions and try to eliminate sexual harassment because it cuts across the board even in the law firms. And let us emphasize on meritocracy and nothing else. And then of course, uh, we need to continuously do gender audits. Without any gender audit, we'll not know the problems, you know? Because sometimes you go for meetings and you are seeing so many women, but you don't want to know what type of women. Like we have so many women at the lower level in the judiciary, at the magistracy, they are, they are more than the, the males. But as the graph goes up to the higher decisions like the courts of record, there are very few. We are lucky now maybe we have one female appointed as an acting chief justice, but we are looking forward to getting a chief justice that is female, the first one in Kenya. And that requires a lot of support from all the colons, political will, a lot of advocacy, and making just the public believe that women are capable and they're able to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aura. And um, uh, it's a pity we couldn't see you on video, but your message was very, very clear. And thank, thank you for taking us through very, very practical consideration uh, from the lack of le legal literacy to uh, the, the, the effects of focusing on marital status, uh, on the very real, and oh, now we can see you, Dr. Aurora. It's wonderful, uh, wonderful to see you. I'm sorry, and, uh, I don't know what happened to David. I'm sorry. But no but problem. Yeah. Great that you could be on video now. Um, you also highlighted the issue of um, um, COVID related uh, uh, school dropout due to pregnancy, which is very much uh, is going to affect. Uh, the, the, the participation of women in the justice sector for in the future years, in the years to come. So um, looking forward to the discussion, but uh, at, this, at the same time, um, it's time to give the floor to Dr. Jarpa uh, Dawuni, uh, who is the executive director of the Institute for African Women in Law and uh, an associate professor at Howard University. So Dr. Dawuni, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. My thanks to IDLO for organizing this wonderful panel and to all the esteemed panelists who have spoken before me. It's great to be here. So I had just five minutes to make my presentation and I'm going to try and make it within that time, kind of capping up all that has been said. My presentation is on looking at the role of research and data in addressing issues of women and gender parity. Looking at what has been said already, the discussions we've had about where women are, how many women do we have in national judiciaries and in international judiciaries, we wouldn't necessarily know that information if we don't conduct the research and gather the data. So that means that data is very important and central to our fight and advocacy for women's equality or gender parity within institutions. So what do the data do? Data 
tells us what the state of affairs are relating to women in judiciaries and justice systems. Data can tell us what is working and what is not working. So for example, from Tunisia, we can know that they have over 50% of women in their judiciaries as compared to Egypt where they have less than 3%. So that tells us that there's something we could probably learn from what has been done in Tunisia and apply that hopefully to Egypt of course, being respectful of the differences in jurisdictions, and then also looking at what has happened within countries in terms of women getting into leadership positions. So my work often focuses on the continent of Africa. So a lot of the examples I'm going to be talking about will be drawn from that place. Data can also tell us what is not working. So in countries where there's been fights and push and advocacy to get women into judiciaries, when there's still not a feminization, what in the literature we call a feminization of women, within the institutions, we can then ask ourselves, why is it not working? And I think to some extent, we've heard from the Honorable Judge from New Zealand, Judge Glazebrick, about the issue and the distinction between merit and diversity. So we need to go back and question some of these stereotypical standards, male standards that have been used in getting women into judiciaries. So when we're talking about data, I want to point out two key points. One is that the data can be quantitative, which is numbers. We can talk about 50%, 20%, 10% and the like. So these are numbers that we can count. But the numbers are very good because they tell us what the state of affairs are. They can be represented in the graphical forms, but the numbers don't always tell us the whole story. So apart from the quantitative data, we also need qualitative data, which is really listening to the experiences of the women themselves, listening to the challenges that women have faced in joining the judiciaries or institutions of justice, but also importantly for those who are within these institutions to hear some of the challenges they face some of the discriminatory practices they face, and some of the issues such as a lack of promotion, lack of access to committees that could also hamper their upward mobility within the profession. So for example, we heard about the IBA showing that even though there is a feminization of women within the, the legal profession in the United States, when you look at it from an intersectional perspective, you disaggregate the data as what we're trying to do now with SDG 1671, is that there may be that women are going up within the profession, but that if you look at it from the perspective of race or disability or other forms of categories that women embody, we find out that women are not all the same. So in as much as the data may tell us something, disaggregating the data, very important for us to understand the lived experiences of women from an intersectional perspective and how that can help us better address the challenges that women face within the professions. So what are some of the ways in which the data and research can help us? The data can pinpoint loopholes, the data can pinpoint success stories, and the data can also pinpoint some of the new issues that we may need to address within professions. So for example, if we're talking about women getting into judiciaries and we're talking about, well, we have 50% women in the judiciary of the country. The next level is, is there a stagnation of women within the judiciary or are women rising to the leadership positions? So for example, a research that we conducted in 2015, looking at women leaders across the continent of Africa, we realized that quite a number of countries have had women as chief justices or presidents of constitutional courts. So if you're looking at the long array of the data, we find that there is some level of progress happening across the continent. But if you look at what is happening at a particular point in time, you may realize that the numbers are low. So it will be inaccurate to say that across the continent of Africa, women are not in leadership positions if you're looking at it at a point X. But if you're looking at it over a period of time, you might realize that they have done much better than maybe other countries. So if we are at point X and the numbers have gone down, then the question is, what do we do? We go back to previous data to help inform what needs to be done, the types of advocacy that need to be done to get women into top leadership positions. So in rounding up, the point I'm trying to, um, the, the conclusion is that at the Institute for African Women in Law, we've been doing a lot of research, looking at women's entry, women's mobility within the professions. And one of the ways we've done this is to issue what we call the gender scorecard, where we are looking at the different regional courts across the continent and globally to see where the women are 
where their leadership positions fall and how many women we have. And we can continue to do this through partnerships. So apart from what we are doing, we are also looking at some of the solutions. And IDLO has done a great job in providing us with data research in the justice sector broadly. And as institutions located across the continent of Africa and also across the world, the best way for us to have that quantifiable data is to build partnerships, to promote research from regional perspectives, sub-regional perspectives, and global perspectives. So through organizations such as UN Women, uh, IDLO, the International Bar Association, the International Association of Women Judges, the Institute for African Women in Law, we can come together to promote the research that is disaggregated intercategorical, intersectional, in order to understand the different issues that different women located in different countries in different positions are facing and to have concise and precise recommendations, but being mindful of the differences that exist within these groups. So I end up here on this discussion here for the sake of time, and I look forward to any questions that may come. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Davoni. And uh, from my perspective, this is music to my ears as a director of research. To me, the, the importance of data, uh, especially locally collected uh, regional data, uh, national data can never be underestimated. And this goes in hand in hand with partnership, of course. So it's, it's wonderful to hear it from you, from uh, a specialist in the sector, but also a person with, a, um, with really with hands-on uh, experience uh, at the local level. So thank you for your contribution. Uh, now, just looking at my watch, we have um, several questions coming in. So I would like to give the maximum time for, um, uh, for discussion. We have another... Uh, 10 minutes or so. So um, um, we have a question and perhaps um, uh, Ms. Trifo, um, you could help us uh, answer a, a question or a concern from Chief Justice Rebecca Martinez from the Texas uh, Fourth Court of Appeals, um, who became the first appellate court in the country to be comprised of all women. Uh, so, uh, Justice Martinez uh, agrees that women-dominated courts are viewed as inferior, and while we work twice as hard and achieve the highest efficiency and productivity, um, what more can the legal community do to work towards parity of the perception among judges, regardless of gender or race, and to increase the public's confidence in the judiciary as more women become judges. So what can we do to increase really the confidence in having women judges on the bench? Thank you. It's a, it's a great question and an important question. And um, we've had, at least in the United States, we've had so few women dominated courts that we don't have a lot of experience uh, to bring to bear on answering the question. Um, in my state, we've had a number of women who have served as chief justice here in Arizona. Um, other states have yet to have a single female chief justice. So I guess I would say that the, um, the continued progress of women uh, in the judiciary will over time um, help itself right, that we, we will have more experience with women serving uh, in these roles and over time, um, we will become more accustomed to it and therefore it will be um, less uh, unusual. Uh, but it is clearly a continued um, fight and effort. And every woman lawyer, in my view, has a responsibility, so does every male lawyer, uh, to stand for the rule of law in which we say that all persons are treated equally. And therefore all persons, male, female, um, non-binary, should be treated equally as jurists as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for your comment on this. Um, we also have a question from the uh, Honorable Justice Shonga of the High Court of Zambia, 
And uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Ora, you could help us uh, address this question. Um, uh, Justice Shonga uh, says that uh, we need male champions to change the male spouse partner mindset, and that in some jurisdictions, female lawyers and judges have opportunities, but face challenges from their spouse and partners who believe that uh, this career actually makes uh, the woman disrespectful or feel superior, and therefore women feel um, forced to choose between uh, a profession and a relationship. This is actually a very true reality in many uh, cultures. So we're here we're talking about the influence of um, uh, cultural stereotypes on the uh, career progression of a woman who wants to become um, uh, part of, uh, of the justice sector. So what would be your take on that, Dr. Ora? Okay, uh, the, the male champions can do a critical role because we realize that gender equality cannot be achieved with women alone because women are not the problem. The problem comes from our male counterparts. So if we need um, an effective strategy, we need to involve them to achieve the results that we want. And I was, uh, for example, in Kenya, the women, the women Judges Association have two female, have two male judges. They are not women. But because they believe in the court, they are honorary members of the association. So maybe if you start, okay, that, that is too few, but it is still uh, an entry point to signal to other men that we need to support our women. Because after all, when there's gender equality, we all benefit. Then when we go at the home level, I know where people have to make sacrifices. For example, when you talk about training and promotions in the judiciary, you have a family and a husband who is very patriarchal. He will tell you to choose between the children and the profession because he'll ask you, the first question he'll ask, who are you going to leave the children with? But if it were him, that question cannot arise. You'll just pack his bag and leave. So at the home front, we need men who are strong enough to understand that empowered women is not a threat, you know, but a, a, but a partner in development that can help them progress in their families, can help them progress in terms of their development across the board, whether as a country within their local community and even internationally, because if you can't allow your woman to participate at the local level, there's no way she's going to get exposure to the outside world when she can't get any from home. And this requires a lot of diplomacy and a very pra a pragmatic manner of getting our male counterparts to understand what gender equality is, because for them, when they see gender equality, they believe it is a fight against them, which is not the case. So we need more men as female champions, because when they speak to their fellow men, they're able to understand and uh, know where they're coming from and listen, because it is not so much of a threat to them. But when it comes from a woman, they see the word and the messenger, and they, will not, they may not listen. So we need more male champions to recruit others, become more ambassadors for us to get this level to the gender parity that we need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ora. And um, it's a pity we need to close this discussion. It has been so interesting, and uh, I have truly enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you, um, you have uh, as well. Um, so first of all, let me thank you. Uh, thank 
all of our distinguished speakers. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have you on the panel today. Your insights are um, of extraordinary value for, for us and for the overall discussion on achieving gender parity in the justice sector. Uh, I would like to thank all the attendees. We had so many participants. Uh, please continue to stay in touch with IDLO. Uh, it's um, uh, this is uh, of course it, it's something that we need to do together. So the networking and uh, uh, the, the the close relationship and collaboration among all of us is really fundamental for the cause. Um, I would like to invite all of you also to join our next uh, event, which will be held uh, in the context of CSW next week on the 24th of March, Wednesday. So this is on the elimination of discriminatory laws. So another very, very important topic for gender equality. Um, but with that, uh, and on behalf of ID Law and my Director General, Jan Beagle, uh, thank you so much for being with us today. It has been a great pleasure and an honor. Have a wonderful continuation of CSW and goodbye everyone. Thank you.